Well, this is for me the most intimidating of all audiences. About half of you are uh, students who want my job, and the other half are heroes of energy efficiency who have helped write the story that I'm going to tell you. Uh, so my job is to bridge between you. Uh, and as I am allowed to do from time to time, and now that Jim has convincingly destroyed any pretense that I'm a distinguished visiting expert, I'm obviously part of all of you for a whole host of reasons. What I try to do from time to time is just to come back to Stanford and review the strategy on energy efficiency that so many of you have been part of and give all of you a chance to poke at it and to determine whether it still makes sense and also just to remind you how much it's accomplished uh, because we have been at this together for a considerable period, some of us, and I want to take you back to the origins of energy efficiency in California. Uh, at the outset, which is, it's, a, it's the 40th anniversary of something important, and I'm going to tell you about that. Uh, and then I want to try to make the connection between California and national efficiency progress and promise with an eye toward defending the thesis that the best hope for enduring climate solutions, a theme to which I always find myself coming back, uh, is a clean energy transition that is so compelling and appealing that everyone wants to do it. Uh, and I think we have a fighting chance of achieving that here in California. Uh, I'll tell you why, and then I'll give you a sense of what I think we need to do next. And of course, I'll look forward in the question period to your thoughts on whether this makes sense to you and how you think it could be improved and done better. Because I am first and foremost in all of this, obviously, an advocate. I do not pretend to come before you as a disinterested expert in any sense. I have an agenda. It will become disarmingly apparent very quickly. Uh, and I hope it's part of a constructive conversation about the future of California, the United States, and ultimately the global energy economy. My thesis is that a clean energy transition is already clearly and manifestly underway in the United States, that it has been evident in the fossil record of energy policy and energy consumption and production for at least four decades now, although it has been accelerating in recent years. The two pieces that I put on file in the bibliography for the seminar, one is a, the third in a series of annual NRDC energy reports, the first of which was called The Amazingly Good Energy News. Uh, and it is basically a story primarily about the impact of energy efficiency improvements on U.S. energy consumption and the dramatic counterfactuals that have emerged from the conventional wisdom of 40 years ago, which held that essentially economic health in the United States and elsewhere required growth in energy use, at least in proportion to growth in the economy. Uh, in fact, as many of you know, since 1973, the year of the first great oil embargo, U.S. economy has tripled in size. U.S. energy use is up by about one third. That may be the most important single energy number to keep in mind and to think about going forward as we look at the challenge of decarbonizing the economy. U.S. oil use peaked in 2005. It's 13% lower today. U.S. coal use peaked in 2005. It's down more than 20%. U.S. electricity use, which everyone once assumed would increase at rates greatly in excess of growth in the economy and population, has since 2000 grown at about half the rate of population growth. And the origins of much of this came in California 40 years ago and involved someone that I'm betting most of you have never heard of. It was Jerry Brown's, then Governor Jerry Brown's, first regulatory appointment to the California Public Utilities Commission. It was a man named Leonard Ross. And Leonard Ross confronted projections of electricity needs for the state of California, which implied truly stunning levels of giant power plant construction. Uh, at one time, a plan surfaced that, for example, would have had a Diablo Canyon-sized power plant every seven miles along the California coast. And projections like that were driven by the tyranny of exponential growth, then averaging five, six, seven percent a year in the United States, across the United States, also in California. And Leonard Ross's insight was both that it ought to be possible to do better by taking advantage of more ways to get more work out of less energy, a concept not wholly foreign to the California of the mid-1970s. But the other thing that Leonard Ross brought forward was an idea about enlisting utilities, electric and natural gas utilities, as investors in energy efficiency as an alternative to power plants. And I want to read you from what I think is still probably of all of the decisions ever Ever, ever entered into by public utility regulators. Uh, the most important, uh, in terms of its enduring uh, influence, in terms of getting something profoundly right that no one at the time fully understood, 
Uh, and finally, although I'll enlist the full scholarly resources of Stanford University in this, I can't find anyone who might have given him this idea. As far as I know, he came up with this without much help. Legendary figures of energy efficiency advocacy like Art Rosenfeld, uh, David Goldstein, assure me that they didn't give it to him. Uh, and maybe someone here did, in which case I'd like to hear about it uh, before the end of the session. But this is what Leonard Ross wrote in 1975 in a decision involving the revenues of the, of the Pacific Gas and Electric Company, your hometown utility for most of you. He said this, he said, we regard, he was writing for the whole, he got, he got it two more votes at least. We, we regard conservation as the most important task facing utilities today. Continued growth of energy consumption at the rates we've known in the past would mean even higher rates for customers, multi-billion dollar capital requirements for utilities, unchecked proliferation of power plants, reducing energy growth in an orderly, intelligent manner is the only long-term solution to the energy crisis. At present, this is Ross continuing to write, the financial incentives for utilities are for increased sales, not for conservation. Whatever conservation efforts utilities undertake are the results of good citizenship rather than profit motivation. We applaud these efforts, but we think the task will be better accomplished if financial and civic motivations are not at cross purposes. Uh, and he proceeded to devise in that brief period when he was a commissioner, which only lasted two or three years in the mid-1970s, the beginnings of the regulatory reforms that transformed utilities across the United States from mere commodity selling machines uh, into institutions with the capacity to be effective promoters of energy efficiency. Jim mentioned a concept called revenue decoupling, which I think is probably well known to many of you in this room, but I'll briefly summarize both what it is and isn't and what progress we've made. The idea for it emerged very clearly from Ross himself in that 1975 opinion and then in some decisions that he wrote shortly after that. I should acknowledge that the first regulatory filing, uh, which established electric electricity decoupling for a utility in the United States, again for PG&E, bears the name of Diane Grunick, who is in this room, along with Bill Marcus. But they were building on a foundation as they would be the first to acknowledge that Ross established in 1975. Now, by opening the prospect for utilities becoming more than just commodity selling machines, by opening the prospect of energy efficiency as a resource to be evaluated on equal terms with power plants, Leonard Ross created the basis for a kind of an energy efficiency ecosystem that is first described in terms of materials with which I'm familiar uh, in a document that has Jim Sweeney's name on it. Uh, this is it. It's a publication by the National Academy of Sciences. It came out in the year 2000. It was an evaluation of research and development strategies. And I remember Sweeney's involvement in the passages in question, and so he can't very well disavow them now. His name's on the report. The basic strategy for driving energy efficiency uh, in, in the face of all of the market barriers that then and now stand in its way, and which are well known in this room, three critical elements identified in the report. One was Ross's in, uh, mobilization of utility investment in energy efficiency wherever it's cheaper than the power plants it's avoiding. Uh, one was tax incentives. One was research and development, where the Actual industries associated with energy consuming devices are notoriously short uh, in terms of funding and where public investment can make a demonstrable difference. This report, Energy Research at DOE, uh, which is a review of a quarter century of such research and development funded by the public sector, is full of examples of the effective use of federal R&D, state R&D, married with the financial incentives, married with one other thing. So all of this is an integrated whole and the one other thing which is also a critical part of this, and where there are several able practitioners in this room, including Jeff Byron, who's sitting up front, is efficiency standards. Uh, energy efficiency standards for buildings and equipment, which also date to the Leonard Ross era, except that the bill establishing the nation's first efficiency standards in California was, of course, signed by then Governor Ronald Reagan as one of his last acts as he was heading out the door. And an enduring irony in terms of the, the increasingly partisan evolution of energy policy and the suspicion that anything having to do with efficiency standards is an inappropriate national mandate. It's important for you to know that the president who signed into law the national efficiency standards modeled on the California version a uh, 15 years later in 1987, 1988, that was also Ronald Reagan. State and federal efficiency standards 
incentives in terms of both taxes and utility investment, research and development, integrated together, constantly pushing efficiencies to higher levels. A big part of the reason why you can look at the U.S. energy economy and find examples like the refrigerator of today using a quarter as much electricity as the refrigerator of the late 70s. But what's appealing about that example, which is a combination of standards and incentives in R&D, an almost pure form of the example that Sweeney was pointing to in that report, What's also important to note is that the cost of refrigeration went down at the same time. So that you can look at the cost of refrigerating a cubic foot, and you can, add, you can add in the cost of electricity, you can add in the cost of the refrigerators, and the bottom line is that it costs about one-third as much in inflation-adjusted dollars to refrigerate a cubic foot today as it did when this virtuous progression began in the mid-1970s. The combination of the ability to avoid emissions of carbon dioxide, emissions of every other form of pollutant, and to do it in a way that reduces the cost of energy services is the unique appeal of the energy efficiency vision that Leonard Ross had in 1975 and that continues to drive policy across California and the United States today. Now here I want to make, I want to bring us forward to the present and, and talk about the challenges of continuing this uh, and the unfinished business that remains. Ken Alex was here a couple of sessions ago, or actually maybe in the last class, I think, right? And Ken Alex told you about California's transition toward climate leadership, and he at least mentioned Senate Bill 350, uh, which is an important part of the package of legislation that, Senator, uh, that Governor Brown signed just this past week. Uh, I want to alert you to both Senate Bill 350 and the much less known Assembly Bill 802 that accompanied it because they are going to be an important part of the energy efficiency landscape that the students in this room will inhabit and I hope be part of shaping. In Senate Bill 350, <clears throat> the most important thing for me to say to all of you, because there was some press coverage at the time, and the general theme captured by the New York Times in a rare moment of complete inaccuracy, <laughs> was that the bill had been gutted <clears throat> three days before it passed by having all of the oil provisions removed. Now, I took this personally because Professor Kolstad, who is in this room, has a terrific son-in-law who works with me, uh, and he actually wrote the provisions in SB 350 that are the only ones then and now that were really material to the future of oil consumption, and they're going to drive it down sharply. And the only thing that was removed from Senate Bill 350 uh, in the late and desperate effort by the combined forces of the oil industry was an aspirational goal for oil use reduction in the state of California. Now, I love aspirational goals as well as the next person, but what really mattered about this legislation were the provisions with teeth, and those are the ones I want you to know about. <clears throat> the provision on oil use that had teeth was not removed, and that is the provision <clears throat> that, calls on, that makes for California's electric utilities a new core mission of transportation electrification with Specific goals to be enforced by the California Public Utilities Commission and the California publicly owned utilities of getting, of taking our current, we've got, a, we've got half the nation's electric vehicles on the road in California today, about 150,000. We'll have a million by 2023. We will have by 2030 an escalating number capable in total of cutting, to, of cutting oil use by about one sixth. And we will do that with a massive investment uh, in technology, infrastructure, and effective and, and great design to fully integrate the vehicles to make sure they don't overload the system. We'll be out ahead of the rest of the country in doing it, and we will do it with the full engagement and cooperation of the entire electricity sector, which will basically be invited, uh, as uh, Professor Kolstad's son-in-law memorably put it, to eat the oil industry's lunch and to get paid for doing it. Since the average cost of electricity on a per gallon equivalent basis is about a dollar a gallon, they start out with a hefty head start, even in an era of low oil prices. But that is not the most important part of Senate Bill 350. Uh, the other two parts with teeth that are critical to showing the way forward uh, in terms of California's climate leadership are, first of all, the renewable energy targets, which is a floor, not a ceiling, of 50% renewable energy supply for California's electric sector by 2030. And that's taking our current uh, target of 33% of, uh, by 2020, and obviously moving it forward by about the equivalent of 50%. 
That will be done again with the full cooperation of the utilities and the grid operator for the state of California. Uh, and then finally, and perhaps the least noticed part of the legislation is the energy efficiency provision, which is to take everything that Ross was contemplating and Sweeney was contemplating in terms of incentives, in terms of efficiency standards, look at all we were planning to do between now and 2030, 15 years from now, and double it. Take what was already the most aggressive combined program of standards and incentives in the country and double the impact over the next 15 years. And that is going to be a heavy lift, but by no means beyond the capacity of a state that has already done so much to make progress in all of those dimensions. And those are the aspects of SB 350 that I wanted particularly to leave you thinking about, because they are going to open the way in the next several years for a tremendous upsurge of ingenuity and effort at places like California's utilities, their regulators, both the Public Utilities Commission and the local publicly owned utility boards, like the city of Palo Alto, the Air Resources Board, a tremendous outpouring, and the Energy Commission with its efficiency standards, and the largest state public interest research and development fund in the country, all mobilized to that singular purpose, which is in aid of the governor's effort to get carbon emissions in California down by 40% in 2030. California is essentially meeting the European proposal to do that, which both, and it, which, which both principalities will bring to Paris in December. Uh, and then, of course, to continue down a path that Arnold Schwarzenegger uh, first uh, laid out when he be, after he became governor and called for an 80% reduction in California's carbon emissions by 2050. Now, in thinking about what it will take for California to do that and for the rest of the country to do it, the reason I want you to feel basically positive about it uh, and to have a sense that we are already well on the way, in addition to what I said initially about trends in total U.S. energy use, if you, if you look at the electricity sector, uh, Diane tells me that in a couple of weeks she'll be doing a deep dive with her and Michael Wara into the EPA Clean Power Plan. So all I want to say about it is that to me, the most interesting thing about the EPA Clean Power Plan when I first read it, so this, this is the ambitious, uh, it was thought at the time, a regulatory effort to cut global warming pollution from power plants across the United States. And EP, EPA puts out a regulatory plan that's unlike anything I've ever seen from EPA before. Because what it is basically doing, uh, and it's, I think, well documented and well presented, is that EPA is simply ratifying what was already happening. It will be very hard, I think, for Diane and Michael to convince you that EPA was adding anything of consequence to trends already clearly underway across the United States. So yes, it sounds at least somewhat impressive to say that we will cut carbon pollution from power plants by one third by the year 2030, that being the ultimate objective of the EPA regulation. And that's a, a reduction from 2005 levels. But we're already more than halfway there. And if you look at the resource investment plans of utilities across the United States taking into account their energy efficiency and renewable energy content already, you find that a disarming number of them are effectively there. This is a subject of some disappointment among advocates who work with people like me because they look at the clean power plan and then they look at the resource plans of their own utilities and they can't find any difference. So the question was, why did we do this? And the answer surely is, at least in part, it, was, it is emphatically not a wasted effort to lock into place trends already underway, since nothing assures that they will remain in place. But it is also important simply to bring to the attention of the rest of the world what has been achieved by investment made by utilities across the United States, largely for reasons driven by the interests of customers, rather than any regulatory or environmental mandate. And the fact that that was collectively driving a one-third reduction in carbon pollution by 2030 is heartening news. Now, we got a long way to go to decarbonize the, 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 the energy economy, but it helps enormously to know that we're already part of the way there and that the clear trend and direction is positive. Now, lest I sound mindlessly optimistic, let me now acknowledge the significant challenges we still face. First of all, in terms of the utility engagement on energy efficiency, the business model reforms that Leonard Ross called for 40 years ago are nowhere near finished. The number of states that have adopted revenue decoupling for at least one electric or natural gas utility, the number of states that have actually done what Leonard Ross called for in 1975 is only just over half today. 
Three quarters of the electricity sales across the United States are not subject to revenue decoupling, which means that the utilities that are making them have a strong vested interest in increasing those sales rather than reducing them. For natural gas, the utilities, it's a, it's a little bit better, but even there, 60% of the natural gas sales are outside the decoupling systems that would remove the incentive to increase sales. So we have a lot of work to do together to improve the regulatory business model. And revenue decoupling just makes utilities indifferent to kilowatt hour and electricity sales. It doesn't create what Leonard Ross again called for 40 years ago, a profit motive to accelerate the rate of energy efficiency. The first relatively tentative experiments to do that are only just beginning to take root across the United States and globally. And that too is a major piece of unfinished business. As is a proliferation of potential opportunities either to improve efficiency or to see very significant electricity waste make the climate problem worse. My favorite illustration of this uh, comes from an experiment that NRDC did in cooperation with some Stanford people with access to very good uh, digital metering data from electricity users across Northern California. And we also had access to a number of homes, some of them in Stanford, where we went in and we were able, using the meter data and then the direct inspection, to count something that had never been counted before, which is the, amount, the number of kilowatt hours that are used by devices in your homes that are switched off. So we have today a proliferation of devices that are designed for various reasons to draw power even when they are switched off. And although individually the consumption looks relatively modest, the average total for the average residential household is 1,300 kilowatt hours a year which is the equivalent of three refrigerators worth of electricity use by devices that are turned off. Now that is an illustration of an opportunity to do a lot better and also of the fact that relatively quickly as consumer products change you can see waves of new electricity use that you may not have anticipated simply by looking at past trends. This has happened before. My favorite illustration of the 1990s was a lighting innovation called the halogen torsier lamp, which some of you remember. Gil, I think, used to keep one uh, plugged in in his office. It's a, it was a stalk with a bowl on top, and the lighting element inside the bowl was 500 watts, so that if it tipped over, it had an excellent chance of igniting everything around it. And those briefly became a big enough source of electricity consumption to offset all of the savings from all of the compact fluorescent bulbs sold up to that point. Then happily they largely disappeared, in part because of constructive pressure from a whole host of elements in that energy efficiency ecosystem. You can still get that kind of lamp if you want, but it'll use less than 10% as much electricity. The latest candidate for blowing up electricity consumption statistics is flat screen televisions. Uh, this is a two-part story. Uh, Jeff will remember that the Energy Commission began when flat screen TVs first came out a system of regulation that turned around dramatic increases in electricity use associated with the TVs. The California Energy Commission came in and simply established efficiency standards. At the time they did it, the entire Consumer Electronics Association, one of the more muscular trade associations in California, arrived at the commission and told them that if they adopted those regulations, it is 2010, Californians would no longer have access to television. Now, I'm delighted to report that five years later, the, the California Energy Commission disregarded that advice. Californians still have access to television, and the average electricity use of flat screen TVs dropped by 50%. It's a great story, except that the newest generation of flat screen televisions, which is even bigger, uh, which has 3D imaging, which has high def like you wouldn't believe it, is not, it was, was designed in part to bypass the California standards. Now, they'll be adjusted, and we'll get to the same result. But at least briefly, they too create the possibility of a whole new surge of electricity use we had not anticipated. And it underscores the point I want to leave you with on this. The reason why we need everyone in this room under the age of 40 who is interested in this field is going to be needed and, to, and needed to be mobilized. It's not like there's some kind of inescapable secular trend toward energy efficiency that is inexorably going to keep driving electricity and energy, overall energy use down as the economy continues to expand. Getting the virtuous results that I've described over the past 40 years has required tremendous exertions, starting with people like Ross, but then supplemented by a whole lot of people like all of you. And what the record shows is that those, those efforts can be tremendously effective, but they must not stop now or ever. 
I, I here want to acknowledge my own uh, personal debt as institutional debt to, to Stanford University in one particular way. Uh, and it, uh, it underscores for, I hope, those of you who are thinking about careers, why I want you to think about having my job as a completely realistic aspiration. Uh, one of your uh, adjunct professors, Jane Woodward, started years ago a program called MAP Fellows. Uh, it was a wonderfully insidious way of infiltrating institutions like NRDC by sending them magnificent Stanford students, paid for by Jane Woodward, who once they got there under a fellowship would of course quickly make themselves completely indispensable with the result that I have had to find ways of employing 14 of them so far and there's no sign of the trend abating. They're now called Schneider Fellows, uh, named after Steve Schneider, a legendary uh, California climate scientist and advocate. Uh, and in a room that includes Ann Ehrlich, I need to be clear that the institutional debt is also, of course, to the Stanford faculty as a whole, which has been wonderfully engaged in all of this work. Now, I mentioned Sweeney, I think, I, I, a couple of things I think I now need you to know about people in the room. Uh, Sweeney, although he's never advertised it, you remember when, you remember when Arnold Schwarzenegger became governor of California? Now, let's face it, Arnold Schwarzenegger is a charismatic figure. But his understanding of California's energy and environmental needs was probably at that point at best limited, although his intentions were good. Somehow he picked Sweeney to chair his energy transition. And if you look at what came out of that administration in terms of the quality of its regulatory appointments, in terms of what it achieved, the first economy-wide carbon reduction goals in the United States, uh, just for starters, and the first legislation establishing real limits on long-term investment in coal-fired power that didn't limit its carbon emissions. Illustrative of the sorts of policies that the Schwarzenegger administration brought forward, then ultimately culminating in efficiency standards like the ones for flat screen TVs, but it begins with Sweeney. And then in 2005, when the architecture of the California climate limits is being established, you need to know that an informal group of Stanford faculty created, made themselves into a kind of de facto advisory group for California state government. Paul Ehrlich was one, I believe, the initial chair of that body. And that was the intellectual center of what became AB 32. Uh, and then stretching back for that with, with just one more illustration, uh, Gil Masters was the guy who was called upon at a critical moment in the evolution of California's electricity system. And he remembers this way. He had to go into an auditorium like this one, only instead of me, there's five PUC commissioners sitting behind a big table, and he has to explain to them in the mid-90s why energy efficiency continues to be relevant, even in a world of restructuring, of market domination, uh, and of deregulation. Uh, and he did it well enough so that we were able to preserve in all of the wreckage that became California electric restructuring, which is the subject for another talk on another occasion, the energy efficiency core was preserved and retained so that it continued to grow to its current form. Now, its current form is captured in the second item that we've put in the bibliography for today's readings, and it's NRDC's latest report on the state of energy efficiency in California. I just want to highlight a couple of elements there uh, in terms of giving you a sense of where we are and what we still have to do. Uh, the heartening news is just, if you step back, and what did we accomplish since Leonard Ross kicked it off? The aggregate efficiency achievement in California in terms of both the utility programs, publicly owned utilities, investor owned utilities, and efficiency standards, equal to roughly 3,500 megawatt giant coal-fired power plant equivalents. Uh, that is a record that exceeds that of any other state in the country. At the same time, and I think that this is my favorite way of evaluating the success of California's energy policy, you will often, if you're in a room full of people, as I often am, from people like Texas and Florida, they will go on and on about how cheap their electricity is and how you know, green fanatics like me have driven up the cost of doing business in California. So what I love to come back with them at, and it's highlighted properly in the NRDC report, and it was first brought out by another Stanford associated venture, uh, which is called the Green Innovation Index, the California Green Innovation Index, which I commend to all of you, which looked at what fraction of each state's economy does the electric bill represent? I still think this is one of the best measures in terms of really deciding how burdensome the electric bill is for a state's economy. Well, what fraction of the economy is the electric bill? And of course, California is one of the lowest. Uh, and we always have fun calculating how much higher California's electric bill would be if we were as inefficient as Florida and Texas. 
$24 billion a year compared to Florida. Texas is a little better, not much. And in terms of the ulti an ultimate sense of what the cost of electric services means to a state, that is not a bad measure. But the, but the NRDC report also makes the point, and this is one I want, I'll be pausing shortly to give you all a chance to cross-examine me back, but I want to leave you with a clear sense. We've got, if we want to double uh, the rate of energy efficiency acquisition in California, we've got a lot to do. We've got to solve some deep-seated problems at the California Public Utilities Commission, which are chronicled in the report, having in large measure to do with an adversarial culture that has grown up around the evaluation of savings from utility programs. Ideally, you would like the, the energy efficiency evaluation process to be one of partnerships in, get, in making things better and achieving mid-course corrections. The last thing you want is an adversarial system dominated by the lawyers who are all Sweeney's best friends, doing all the kinds of cross-examination and intimidation and paper shuffling that lawyers are good at, but creating a culture of discord that makes it fundamentally difficult for everyone to move forward together. And we are at real risk of getting mired there in California if we don't push out of it. Now, I think we've made real progress in the last couple of years, and it's chronicled in the NRDC report. Uh, and Diane Grunick got a lot of that started when she was at the California PUC, but there is much still to do. At the same time, we've got a lot of work to do. We're getting to the hardest point uh, in, the in the building efficiency standards, residential and commercial buildings, if we really want to drive toward a doubled rate of savings, uh, we are getting to the point where we have got to be thinking about neighborhoods like the West Campus at UC Davis that are literally, in terms of their own uh, generation and their own efficiency, uh, able to avoid any net carbon emissions. And we are not there yet in terms of our efficiency standards, and we have a ways to go, and we've got to get there in proceedings uh, in which there are going to need to be negotiations with the regulated industry and a lot of innovation and a lot of cooperation uh, in how to accelerate the pace of efficiency. We're going to have to make full use of what is now, again, the country's largest research and development fund, over $160 million a year, administered jointly by the California Energy Commission and the California PUC, and I would love to see some in this room uh, engaged more fully in the deployment of those resources. Uh, and then finally, we've got to think about accelerating our progress on the utility business model. We've got revenue decoupling in California. Leonard Ross and his immediate predecessors saw to that. But we're now at the stage where we're going to have to take the next step. We're going to have to be more creative in terms of earnings opportunities. We're going to have to be willing to look at changes in the ways that people pay for electricity that will move away from some of the historic norms. And there's a tremendous argument right now about how to do that. And some of it is incredibly public and adversarial. There'll be a mass rally at PG&E on Wednesday, for example, where you'll get a flavor for that part of it. I want to leave you with the sense that I actually am quite optimistic uh, that we'll find a way forward on rate design for electric utilities that will work for everybody from the most determined of the solar advocates to the most uh, reactionary of the utility shareholder uh, organizations. But that is the pro that's the, uh, the, the uh, challenge immediately before us uh, that will take several years to work out. Let me now give you a chance to come back at me, recognizing what I've tried to do here is give you a sense of the sweep of the 40 years of energy efficiency policy, starting in California, then expanding to the nation that has delivered some really amazingly good energy news and set the United States and California on a path toward decarbonization, only the first steps. But with the first steps as appealing and straightforward as these, I think, rightly will look to the rest of the world, there's real hope for what might happen at Paris and beyond. Now, Sweeney, you're the one who's supposed to uh, preside over this part of the proceedings. Well, thank you, Alex. Sure. <laughs> Some students first, or those who look young enough to be a student. <laughs> <laughs> Not you, you don't. <laughs> uh, some students, yes, yes, yes. Uh, do you see there being scope for significant gains through educating individuals and households to make changes, or is that just a drop in the bucket compared to these utility and organizational level changes? What, what I learned long ago is to avoid the appearance that any of these approaches were zero-sum alternatives to the other. So my first response, when I'm asked about be behavioral programs in general, I was an early supporter of O-Power, which many of you know is a leader in that field. 
No, I think that can be a significant contribution, particularly if it's done in partnership with the utilities themselves. I think it will work better. And this is, for a long time in California, the reason actually that we had masters up in front of the PUC was there was an argument that it was time to make a choice and that we could either go with a utility-led system of investment or we could throw them aside and move to what the California PUC called the genius of the marketplace. And what people like me have been pleading then and ever since is that we need all of these approaches, that they're not, they shouldn't be viewed uh, as mutually inconsistent. Uh, and the utility programs, those of you who are interested in behavioral approaches, and there are plenty of great behavioral economists at Stanford, will see all kinds of new openings there and a real willingness to engage on it, along with programs that are designed more in the nature of just hardwiring in the efficiency improvements so that people don't have to think about them. And you do have people around the country fighting with each other over which of these approaches is better. I would prefer to have both. Yes, up there. Um, in terms of next steps, what yeah. are your thoughts on New York's REV program? Uh, New York State is looking at a system of regulatory reform for its utilities, which has the acronym REV, and many of you probably have different levels of familiarity with it, but at its heart, in its most important dimensions, it's about two things. One is defining the role of a regulated distribution system uh, and determining how rich that role will be and how much responsibility will go to the regulated utilities for integrating and promoting all of the exciting new small-scale generation and end-use efficiency technologies. My prediction there is the commission will end up deciding to give the utilities a robust role. It will go in a different direction than California did 20 years ago. California tried to dispense with regulated utilities, bitterly regretted it, and restored them promptly after that. The other thing New York has to do is to work out some of these rate design reforms. And the great question there is, are we, going to charge for, are we going to continue to charge for electricity based on how much you use? Or are we going to move more and more toward a system in which a big part of the monthly bill is fixed, or in a few extreme cases in Texas, all of the monthly bill is fixed? In Texas, they call that the all-you-can-eat rate. We don't want that. We need to have a way of charging based on how much you use, but making sure in the process that everyone who's connected to the system makes a reasonable minimum contribution. I express to you here, without turning this into a rate design <coughs> seminar that would cause Sweeney to expel me from the room, that a way will be found. And NRDC is spending a lot of time now working on ways to make sure that, yes, you keep basically paying based on how much you use, but there are appropriate provisions in place so that everyone connected makes a minimum contribution. And I think if we do that, and if increasingly we pay based on how much electricity costs at different hours of the day, uh, we will find a way to allow for all of the innovation we want without at the same time losing the capacity to have a thriving distribution system uh, that's also an important part of success here. Yes, right there. Uh, wondering, I appreciate the Leadership California show, but wondering if there are other states that you look to for solutions, and if not in the U.S., perhaps north of the border or elsewhere around the world. Oh, I, I don't look first and foremost to California for solutions, uh, first of all. So I need to make an admission here. When I arrived at NRDC, I was given the best job at NRDC. I was assigned to the Pacific Northwest. So I was assigned Oregon, Washington, Idaho, and Montana, which have an integrated electric system, which over the period I described have been conducting the same kind of energy efficiency initiatives as California. And if you want to look at a place that really competes head to head with California over the decades in a wonderfully constructive way, I would send you first to the Pacific Northwest. I would send you to the Northwest Power and Conservation Council which is the overseer of those efforts, which has created the most robust regional energy efficiency initiative in the country called the Northwest <coughs> Energy Efficiency Alliance, the best system of measurement and evaluation, which California is now trying to follow, uh, which turns the whole exercise from adversarial into cooperative. And then finally, results in terms of savings that clearly rival California. It's my favorite. The Northwest rightly boasts that 35 years of energy efficiency investment have both created more electricity supply than all the big hydropower dams on the Columbia, including the Grand Coulee, that's number one. And number two has reduced the annual electric bill for the region by more than $3.3 billion. That's a good story. Uh, it, it's right up there with ours. And then New England is good. New York has a lot to brag about. There are some very strong programs historically in the Midwest. I was just in southern Florida, which, whose uh, hometown utility, Florida Power and Light, although it's had some recent difficulties, claims credibly to ha have had the first energy efficiency programs in the country, 1973. 
even before Ross. So the nice thing about this, for those of you who want to engage on it, is there is plenty to talk about across the United States. Britain has a very interesting uh, utility business model reform of its own. Its acronym is RIO rather than REV, R-I-I-O. We don't monopolize this. But I think the California story, in terms of its cumulative impact, in terms of the effective mobilization of everything Sweeney talked about in that 2000 report, still, for me, is my favorite story. Thank you. The, the floor is now open for anybody, including non-students. Yes, sir. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, uh, thank you very much for uh, your very professional, blurry presentation. I'm sure the Supreme Court oral arguments are in your future somewhere. <laughs> uh, okay, so there are a couple of points. I used to contribute regularly to the NRDC. Yep, you'll yell a little louder. I used to contribute regularly to the NRDC. I hate sentences that start like that. <laughs> go, go ahead. And you, you should know why I don't any longer. Uh, because I've explained it to them several times. Go ahead. Right, which lawyers understand. Right? Yes. Because <coughs> they've gotten off the science. Energy efficiency is fine. Everybody, I'm an engineer, appreciate that. Electric, electrical engineer. Electricity has resulted in the largest efficiency gains in the industrial history of this country. Here, here. So, my question is, and this relates to the myopia at NRDC, your bosses. You quoted Ross as saying you want to have proliferation of all these generating plants. Right. Right. And yet, California, including in our current plan, is uninformed, as is NRDC, and other people are not. Let me make that clear around the world. Every time California installs a window, they have to install part of a gas plant because the windmill only generates <coughs> like most 20% of the time. So you've got to have enough gas available. As we do in California, we keep adding gas plants. I want you to make oh, sure right. you what question. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So yep. I'm trying to... What about this? So, yeah. So why is NRDC have these ridiculous e emails to us that show windmills? Because we know for a fact they are not going to solve the problem. They require 2,000 tons of raw materials per megawatt of average installed power. So well, tell me why. Yeah, so, so I, <laughs> I, I, I hope it doesn't sound, although I agree, so the, where we're in violent agreement is we think energy efficiency is the biggest part of the solution. Uh, and then the question becomes, what's the rest of the solution? What does the portfolio look like? And there, I think the most important thing to say is that what states like California are doing, and here I hope we'd again be in violent agreement, is there's, what's, what's in place are overall targets for reductions in emissions. So in the case of California, it is, for example, 40% by 2030. Uh, it was 20% by 2020. That was in the Schwarzenegger targets in AB 32. The issue then is going to be what is the best way of moving ultimately toward decarbonization of the entire system. And what I want to, there are theologians for every solution. There are wind theologians, there are solar theologians, there are nuclear theologians, and I bet there's some in this room for all of those and more. And my job, and I actually, I, I, could, I could defer to the bosses at NRDC, but I don't really have a boss, so I think this is going to come down on me. My job is to make sure that, the, that we are, our principal focus is on the overall objective, which is decarbonizing the economy, and we are picking the best buys. I, I, once, I, I will leave you, and here I think this is, would not be an area of discord between us, with what the chairman of the Northwest Power and Conservation Council said to me after the creation of the council's first plan, the first step in the direction of a decarbonized region. Uh, and he said, I don't want to hear from any more of you theologians. I have one principle driving me in picking my energy investments. You know, subject to whatever the pollution control requirements are, buy only what you need and buy it as cheaply as possible. And I think that what I predict that that philosophy will do is drive you toward a lot of energy efficiency and then an interestingly diverse collection of other resources. And where you and I end up duking it out is if, in fact, wind power produces as much carbon emissions as a coal plant, which some people actually do believe, I don't, it will not prevail. It will have to be paired with alternative ways of meeting its variable output requirements that don't do that. And if it can't, it will fail a competitive test. I am for a competitive test where we all buy only what we need and we buy it as cheaply as possible. We've been pretty much doing that in California for 40 years. Big winner's been energy efficiency. I don't want to stop. 
Okay, right there. Next hand. Yeah. <laughs> First of all, are you? Did you notice that the five tenets of transparency? Those are the five tenets that came up in the last day or two, um, <coughs> saying you've got to you got to design the utility issue instructions for the CPUC basically to design the utility system so it's transparent and so that you allocate the returns to the people like to the third party provider right. and stuff like that. Um, and what's the benefit of that? And um, regarding the, I think you do need the. The EPA's plan, and you've got to clean up the intransigent third free riders. And then on the uh, other thing, batteries within a year, within two years, batteries are going to be down at $145 or less per kilowatt hour. Make it a whole lot easier if you're right. And it'll last a long time. <coughs> Breakthroughs happening as I speak. So let me focus uh, on, on the, the, the most important part of that question, I think, and, and you're right, is what, what, uh, what we need more advocates for right now in terms of the transformation of the system uh, is ways of developing partnerships between utilities and third party providers where everyone is in fact getting a return for what they're providing. And my only plea, because I accept your point in that proposition, is that we try to find ways of, of working together to accomplish that result so that it's not a pitched battle between Solar City and PG&E. Uh, it is actually, we actually set up systems where pg e wants to work with the distributed resource providers where the success of one contributes to, su to the success of the other and they can thrive together. And what I know for sure, and I'm sure there are entrepreneurs and innovators in this room who are frustrated with just how hard it is to work with some of these giant monopoly utilities. Uh, the, the favorite, every utility conference I used to go to would begin with a joke that if a utility CEO ever decided to commit suicide, he'd jump in front of a glacier. <laughs> and there was some truth to that. But the fact is, you need each other. Uh, and we have got to find a way to make the Silicon Valley culture and the PG&E Southern California Edison cultures interact effectively. And there's pro that's probably a career opportunity for half the people in this room. But if it's a, if it's a pitched battle, if it's adversarial hand-to-hand -hand combat, if it's demonstrations in front of the PG&E headquarters all the time, we will not make progress together. Neither side will be able to succeed alone. And on that point, I'd like to uh, say all good things must come to an end, including this one. Thank you, Al. Thank you. <laughs>